Hello everyone, my name is Edu Gomez Escandell. I'm in the WSL team in Canonical. And today I will show you an example usage of Windows Subsystem for Linux, in particular when applied to developing numerical computation applications. So let's start with some context. Why do, what do I mean with numerical computation applications? I mean any numerical computing tools that solve any engineering or just in general like physics or chemistry or just scientific problem such as thermal analysis or stress analysis or fluid simulations, maybe chemical reaction simulations, even electromagnetics, you name it. So let's see the difficulties that you may face when developing one of these applications. Well, the first thing is that developing a good solver for these problems is very expensive, so you'd rather do it only once. However, uh, some or actually most solvers use the same code in two very different contexts. Uh, first, they need to run on desktop, usually Windows, uh, and this is used for testing or small simulations that are not very expensive. And these usually exploit shared memory parallelism tactics, such as frameworks like OpenMP or C++ 17's standard parallelism, or other strategies such as, such as CPU vectorization, GPUs, etc. Now, other than desktop applications, they also need to work in clusters. That means solving massive problems on distributed supercomputers that generally run Linux. This will use both the uh, aforementioned shared memory parallelism, but also distributed memory parallelism. And the way I will focus on today is using MPI, uh, the message passing interface, and in particular, open MPI. So having these problems, how can developers of these sorts of problems boost their productivity? Well, the first is to share as much code between the implementations of Windows and Linux as possible to make for faster and safer developments and also to develop mostly on a Windows machine. However, when you need to switch back to Linux because, well, certain things will only need to work on Linux, to go those relating to MPI, or simply because you want to or you have to test on both platforms, then you can very quickly switch between one and the other using WSL, either with the console or with VS Code or whichever tool you prefer. Now, once on WSL, you can use MPI to segment your memory, by which will run your program in multiple processes, and this will sort of simulate what it would look like on a supercomputer. Now, how do we do this? Because we said we have to share the same code, but at the same time, we depend on MPI in some version of the code and we don't in the other. Well, the simplest way of doing this is by creating a wrapper around the MPI library, and then uh, have a template compile either the wrapper that uses or that does not use MPI. And the one that does not use MPI will mock it. And we'll see how here. So here we have, for instance, a class we'll called basic communicator, which is like the basic unit of MPI. And as you can see, it's template on, on what operating system we're running on, as well as uh, whether you want to enable or not MPI. So this is what the wrapper would look like on, on Linux with MPI enabled. And we see that it's simply a C++ function, actually a method of the previous class that will call the MPI C library. And there's not much more to it, simply a bit of conversion and that's all. Now on Windows, what you'll do is something else. See, the broadcast directive in MPI is a, is a directive that what it does is it takes a piece of data in one of the processes and it sends it to every other process. However, when you're not running on a distributed system, sending it to every other process means effectively doing absolutely nothing. So in this case, it's very easy to mock. And you'll do similar things where on Windows, you simulate what would happen if you run the distributed process on a single process. So I don't have the time to develop a full numerical simulation to show you what that would look like. So I have made a simpler implementation of another numerical problem, not as not as useful to the industry, but still illustrative. So what I'm gonna do is to draw the Mandelbrot set. And before that, I will explain uh, quickly what the Mandelbrot set is. So let's take an arbitrary point, let's call it C, uh, which is in the complex plane. That means it has both a real and an imaginary component. We store the value of C in a variable Z1. And then if you can guess that if there's a Z1, there's gonna be a Z2 as well. <clears throat> the way you compute Z2 is you square the previous one, Z1, and you add the original point to it. And if there's a Z1 and a Z2, you can probably guess there's a Z3 as well. How do you compute Z3? You square the previous one and you add the, the original number. Now, if you keep on repeating this process, eventually you see that in this case, the number simply blows off to infinity. Uh, but are we guaranteed that this will happen at some point? The answer is no. For instance, if we start at this point, 
then something that might happen is that after a few iterations, you return back to the original one and you simply iterate forever. So the natural question then becomes, hey, which points iterate forever and which ones blow up to infinity? And the answer is, you just got to try with a bunch of points and see what happens. However, we have a trick up our sleeves, which is that if a point ever goes outside this circle, that means it's going to blow up to infinity. And this circle uh, just means that the point has a absolute value greater than two. So what we can do to see what the Mandelbrot set looks like is let's choose just a bunch of points in the complex plane. And then what we do is at each point, we see what happens. Does it go outside of the circle or does it stay inside for say 50 iterations because you have to stop at some point. And what happens if you do this is that you get this drawing, which is not very satisfying. So let's do something. Let's instead of using like a hundred points, let's use a million. And what you see is this image here that you might start to recognize. The points painted in black means that the iterative process never went beyond uh, that radius of two. And the white points, that is the outside of the image, are all the points that diverged. Now, this is nice and all, but we maybe want to learn a bit more about this set. So what we can do is instead of painting them all white, we can paint them according to how many iterations it took looping around the center before it went off to infinity. And we paint them in different shades of gray according to these parts, and then we get a drawing like this one. Now, this is nicer, but it's not very colorful and it's a bit boring. So instead of using this sort of color gradient, let's just pick four or five colors and just alternate them uh, to, to show this process. And the final drawing you get is this one, which you might be familiar with because it's very typical of the Mandelbrot set. Now, an interesting property of the Mandelbrot set is that it's infinitely detailed. That is, you can zoom in deeper and deeper and deeper, and you always get more detail, as you can see in the very zoomed image to the left. Another interesting property of the Mandelbrot set is that um, it, ha it, it shows self-similarity. As you can see in the image to the right, has sort of a copy of the bigger object. Uh, so that was the Mandelbrot set. So let's see how computing the Mandelbrot set would look like if we wanted to do it on a distributed system. Well, the way you do it is in each process that you have divided your execution into, you will uh, take a small part of the image. So as you can see here, we chose five processes and you will simply basically generate the image for that chunk of, of the Mandelbrot set. Now, once you've done computing the image in that sector, what you do is you promote one of the processes and say it's the root, take the image it has generated and store it to a file. Now, every single process which will send its chunk of the image to the root process, and then the root process will draw it to the file. So we'll keep going like this. And in the end, we have this final file in the same place in memory, uh, preferably on disk, with the full image. And that's the way I generated this image, basically. Now, if you were to do this on Windows, it would be the equivalent of the first process drawing this, the entire image. So on real engineering or just general simulation problems, uh, this will look very similar. You will take your, your domain, the area of study, and you will split it in roughly equal sizes, or rather equally computationally expensive uh, sets. Uh, communication is a bit more complicated with these types of problems because uh, different parts of the domain will interact with each other and you have to ensure that this communicate, communication uh, happens the, the proper way. But the, the essence is the same. Now, to reiterate the point, why using WSL? Well, uh, first, why use both Windows and Linux? Well, first, because you have to, supercomputers and desktop applications, but you have to develop on and, and, and both applications also because well, first, the wrapper is not going to be the same as using the real thing. So you cannot just develop on Windows and hope that it works in MPI. And also, Windows and Linux compilers won't always agree on what is legal or what to warn you about. So in that regard, you will get the, the best conforming program possible by compiling on both sides and testing on both sides. Now, why WSL then? Well, in my experience, if switching between WSL uh, sorry, between Linux and Windows is too painful. Developers will simply not switch between the two and will stick to one of the two platforms. Then what they'll do is they'll use your CI CD system as the test bed. I know it because I've done this. Uh, and this is of course expensive to the company and basically wasteful in general. 
So uh, using WSL reduces this friction, making it more likely that developers will choose to test their program both on Windows and Linux in their own machine before committing it to the repository. So if you thought this was interesting, you can see my implementation of both the Mandelbrot set drawer and the MPI wrapper at this repository. Mind you, it's a very small subset of the MPI library that is implemented here. Uh, but still, you can visit this link if you wish to. And to the bottom, we have a perhaps more interesting case, which is uh, Kratos Multiphysics, which, which also uses this strategy uh, on actual production code. So you can check out this link that I, I wrote here. And if you're very interested, you can check out the particular files that contain this sort of complexity uh, that are written on screen as well. I hope you thought this presentation was useful and hopefully I've convinced you that WSL is the right tool for the job.